long ago, 10 million years at least, in the equatorial jungle of Southeast Asia, the earliest of our human ancestors evolved from the orangutan. Since that time, our paths seldom crossed, until a century or so ago, when people began unwittingly to bring these magnificent animals to the brink of extinction. But one determined woman is now fighting back to save the endangered orangutan and ensure its survival in the treetops of Borneo. Tanjung Puting is a low-lying tropical rainforest, an Indonesian national park, and the largest protected area of forest which once covered most of South Borneo. Dr. Baruti Goldikus, who's lived and worked here for 25 years, likens the jungle land to the Garden of Eden. The sheer variety of plants and animals is staggering, like a huge, well-stocked natural hothouse. It was Borneo's famous great ape, the orangutan, that brought Baruti to this undiscovered paradise in 1971. Since then, she's dedicated her life to these enchanting creatures. Swirchi is about uh, three years old. He's a local boy. He, he had been captive, held captive in a logging camp close by. And we named him Schwarzy after Schwarzenegger, the actor, because uh, when we first encountered him, he looked relatively weak and faint, and we thought that this would be a name that would perhaps encourage him to grow big and strong. And that promise has indeed been fulfilled to some extent. Since he's been here, he started eating, he's getting a coat, and we hope will indeed be eventually as big as his namesake, or even bigger. The Camp Leakey headquarters were named by Dr. Galdicus after a British anthropologist. Dr. Lewis Leakey was convinced that studying the great apes would throw light on human evolution. And it was Leakey who encouraged Baruti to realize her dream and study orangutans in the jungles of Borneo. I think there were many moments when I decided that orangutans would be my life. I think those moments all reinforced one another. I feel very strongly that I was born to study orangutans. I've always felt a very deep attraction to orangutans. I think part of that attraction had to do with the fact that orangutans have never left the canopies of the tropical rainforest, which once was our own Eden, the tropical rainforest from which our ancestors uh, must have emerged millions of years ago. There was always something eerily human-like about orangutans, and I think that's been part of their fascination for me. Nowadays, there are perhaps only 15 to 20,000 orangutans left in the wild on Borneo and Sumatra, an area bigger than France, Spain and Portugal combined. The world's largest tree-living mammal, most of their time is spent in the high forest canopy 100 feet up from the ground. Occasionally, they'll hunt insects on the forest floor, but more often than not, stay in the safety of the high branches. The adult males are big and beefy, weighing 200 pounds or more, with the reputed strength of four fit men. The mature males show the characteristic cheek pads and fleshy throat pouches that help in making their long, eerie calls. The babies stick to their mothers like limpets for the first three years of life. It's akin to the human being's early development, in fact, the orangutan's life pattern is not far removed from our own. The offspring stay with their mother for the first six to eight years of life, and the orangutans don't reach breeding age until their mid-teens. They'll live well into their 40s or 50s, and some captives have been known to live even longer. What one basically does is follow the orangutan wherever he or she might go until he or she makes a nest for the following night.
but many times I have been up to my waist in black pools of acidic water. There are insects, there are all kinds of stinging, toxic substances in the forest. It's physically a very, very grueling kind of exercise. When the young Baruti first arrived in Borneo in 1971, little was known about orangutans. Their biology and their social lives had never been properly documented. Although psychology and anthropology were her background, her first task was to find out what made the orangutans tick. When I first came here, I was very interested in knowing when things happened. I wanted to know how old orangutans were when they gave birth. I wanted to know how old the orangutans were when they were weaned or when they set up their home ranges. Under Dr. Leakey's tutelage, Beruti Goldicus joined an elite group of women who had made primates their life's work. Jane Goodall had studied chimpanzees in Tanzania, Diane Fossey, mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Collectively, the three young women became known as the Trimates. It wasn't long before much of Baruti's time was being taken up looking after orphaned and ex-captive orangutans who were victims of a growing illicit trade in wild animals. The cruel and barbaric ape trade still goes on in some parts of Asia, and a lucrative market exists for young orangutans as pets or for entertainment, particularly in Taiwan. Bagong spent the first half of his life behind bars until Baruti secured his freedom. When he was a small infant, he was captured, taken from his mother, taken to a zoo in Java, where he spent at least 10 years, maybe more. Dr. Goldicus brought Bagong back to Camp Leakey. In the zoo, he'd had a reputation for being wild and dangerous. But when the cage door was finally opened to set him free, Bagon just took to the treetops to get his bearings and then quietly slipped into the forest and wasn't seen again for well over a year. Imagine spending, say, 20 years in a zoo and then at the threshold of adulthood, being released back to the wild, and then spending almost another 20 years in the wild. I mean, what a life story he could write if he could write his autobiography. And what his feelings must be. I mean, I'd love to be able to talk to him and ask him what it felt like, what it feels like. Normally, each young animal is assigned a local Dayak handler, and in the nursery area, the team tries to prepare the youngsters for an independent life once again in the wild. One of Baruti's main aims is to rehabilitate young apes that have been held illegally. Add to that the young orphans from poaching, and she's got her hands full. <laughs> But however well she and her dedicated team from the International Orangutan Foundation prepare these youngsters for a life in the wild, the sad fact remains that their future is far from certain. Orangutans live to eat. It's very clear 
that a wild orangutan's life is about food, and more food, and then food again. If you look at the lives of wild orangutans, they spend about 60% of every waking day feeding or foraging. And then they spend about another 20% of the day moving from one food source to the other, and then approximately another 20% resting. So their lives are basically about food. You can't get away from that fact. It's very clear from the way that orangutans move through the forest that they are monitoring uh, the phenological state of various trees. They seem to have a sense of when things will be fruiting, probably from seeing those trees in flower. Orangutans eat over 400 different types of food in this forest. Over 200 of those foods are fruits, wild fruits. Orangutans are probably the most superb botanists on this planet. And it's ironic that you know the best botanists on this planet don't have PhDs, but in fact are wearing you know red suits. Animals face stiff competition for the available food supplies in the forest, and from time to time, Yayat is driven by hunger to visit Dr. Geldicus's soup kitchen for a handout. He's been here for about 10 years, but he's been gone in the forest as long as two years. So it's a very sincere and deep pleasure when he comes back to camp. Baruti first noticed Yayat when he was confined to a small cage in a camp run by the Indonesian Forest Service. She suggested he be freed at Camp Leaky, and since then, he's become a firm favorite. But life in the wild has been no picnic for old Yayat, and his battle scars are there to prove it. As an official advisor on orangutans to the Minister of Forests, Dr. Galdikas is constantly reminding the Indonesian government of the repercussions of continued habitat destruction. In turn, they've responded by financing a feeding program at Camp Leaky, as well as extending the boundaries of the park. The mature males are by nature loners. Dr. Galdikas even compares them to New Yorkers, seldom exchanging greetings or making eye contact. But their monastic existence is an adaptation to circumstances. Because they have to expend so much time in harvesting their food which is thin on the ground, congregating in groups would be counterproductive. Competition would mean having to spend even more time foraging, so wasting energy. In this tropical rainforest, food is a problem. And this is why all rehabilitation programs have to take that under consideration. If they don't, they're doomed to failure.
The feeding program serves two purposes. It augments the available natural food supply for the wild orangutans, and at the same time, the feeding site provides a venue where the young Camp Leaky orphans can mingle with their wild cousins and learn important survival skills. They like to watch and learn how things work. Uh, they're very observant. And one of the wonderful things about releasing orangutans into a forest where there are wild orangutans present is that the wild-born ex-captives seem to learn by imitating uh, the wild orangutans. Without mothers to teach them the basics, the orphaned youngsters must become jungle-wise by observing their wild cousins. The leftovers from the old boys' mealtimes teach the young about new foods. Even noticing which trees the older animals frequent is valuable information for when they finally have to fend for themselves. For their survival, the young orangutans at Camp Leakey must learn well. The world is a hostile place. The lush tropical forests of Borneo and Sumatra are under siege as never before. And for the species that zoologists have named in Latin as Little Pongo, the writing is on the wall. This impromptu picnic is a Camp Leaky festive occasion. Princess, who was raised by Baruti, has brought her brood to visit their surrogate grandmother and perhaps secure a feed into the bargain. Like any proud grandparent, Dr. Galdicus needs little encouragement in sharing her family's accomplishments. This is Pan, and Pan is a little over a year old. And up there is Princess's offspring, Pita. And Pita is six years of age. This is a little bit unusual, having two offspring following the mother. Normally, the birth interval for orangutans in this area is about eight years. So, the princess is pumping them out. And she's never lost an infant. She's had three infants, and her oldest offspring is now an adolescent, and he's basically returned to the wild. Somewhere out there, is an orangutan named Prince. Camp Leakey is one of the few places on this planet where apes and people are entirely equal. And in fact, sometimes one thinks that the orangutans are more equal than everybody else. Once in ancient times, these animals ranged far across all of Southeast Asia. But now Camp Leakey is one of only a handful of sanctuaries. Here, for the time being at least, thanks to the devotion of Dr. Galdicus, animals like Bagong and Yayat and little Schwartzy can have an assured future. But elsewhere, the picture is bleak. Every day, the wholesale destruction of Borneo's forests gets closer to the Tanjong Puting Reserve and Camp Leakey. Every day, the Ruti Galdicus witnesses the very guts being ripped from the vital forest habitat. Seemingly unstoppable forces are at work. The world's insatiable demand for rare and exotic hardwoods, the lure of gold that lies beneath the riverbeds. And that is why Baruti knows that her life must continue here in Borneo. The very survival of the orangutan depends upon it. Orangutans can't speak for themselves, and it's very important 
that they have people speaking for them or people working to try and save them in their home. If we wish to save orangutans in the wild, we have to save those forests where they live. What happens is when the forest is converted, when the forest is cut down, we have homeless orangutans. Those homeless orangutans are then out in the open. They're very vulnerable because they're slow. Any person with a pack of dogs and a spear and a machete can get them. In 10 years, the wild orangutans have halved in number. The expendable flotsam of what Biruti sees as a global economy that creates greed but no satisfaction and desire but no happiness. Orangutans are being killed as individuals, even as we sit here in this magnificent forest. They're being killed because they don't count as much as human beings count. They are part of this definition that allows us to get rid of things or people that have no consequence to us because they are not us, they're not a part of us. Sometimes I feel that we're like those good country folk who watched those trains go to Auschwitz and said, you know, this really has nothing to do with me and I really don't want to know. And the tragedy that is befalling the orangutans is not of somebody's malicious making per se, but it is an equally deep tragedy and it will end up with orangutans being demolished as a species in the wild. So we have to stop being those good country folk who look the other way. We have to take a look at those trains and where those trains are going and say, what can we do to derail them? And what we have to do to derail them is part of a global process. It's part of something that is happening all over this earth. We have to stop the destruction of tropical rainforests. We have to stop the destruction of nature. We have to start accepting nature as part of what we are as humans. And we have to start accepting the fact that without nature, we cannot survive. We cannot exist.